another 20th century orchestral classic for BBC Two Now, this being the first commission given by the BBC to a British composer. We present the life and masterwork of William Walton, Belshazzar's Feast. Leeds Town Hall, and a score that simply breathes the English choral tradition. It's gone on to become a robust bastion of the repertoire. This program brings Walton's oratorio, Belshazzar's Feast, back to the city in which it was first performed nearly 70 years ago. Belshazzar's Feast, I think, is one of the great choral works of the century. Belshazzar's Feast comes from a long tradition of choral music in England and especially in the north of England. Yeah, this, here at 33, I would like less from the tenants, okay, less, but I want to hear the orchestra here. This, of course, is the milieu in which Walton himself grew up, as he did with the other feature of this work, the, the brass band. Brass band, Steve. Um, can, you, can you play this standing? Walton was very happy, I think, when someone suggested he should have two brass bands in addition to a symphony orchestra there, so, so he grabbed it as a true northerner would. Let's, can we try it, please? It's very punchy, very daring, the departure uh, from what we understand oratorios to be. It makes this bold statement using rhythms and certain instruments that um, have hardly ever been sort of recognized and accepted as something to make a religious statement. Right, do it once again. For this performance, the BBC Symphony Chorus is joined by the Leeds Festival Chorus, who originally gave the premiere.
The structure of the piece is very clear. You have this opening lamentation by the waters of Babylon. We sat down and wept. It's very much in the English tradition, harmonically. There's this sense of, of bitter sweetness, as I say, and, uh, and a melancholic sense that runs through a lot of English music through the centuries. The work goes on to depict the worship of pagan gods at the feast of the Babylonian King Belshazzar. Then there's his dramatic fall as a mysterious hand condemns him with writing on the wall. And the music ends with the celebration and alleluias of the Israelites freed from captivity in Babylon. Let's do a little handle and see where it takes us. The supreme choral work, of course, that all choral societies in this country have lived on is the Messiah. The most famous chorus from the Messiah is the Hallelujah Chorus. And that must have been somewhere in the back of Walton's mind when he wrote his own hallelujahs towards the end of the piece as the Israelites rejoice at the defeat of Babylon. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Walton's hallelujahs have much more bounce and are much more 20th century. They swing, you know, in a way that, that, that Handel doesn't. Make sure that that's really full. Alleluia, alleluia. Hallelujah chorus stands there as one of the great tributes to God. Walton's hallelujahs are bound to man and his elation at the expense of somebody else. That's a feeling that comes very definitely across. I think Belshazzar's feast represents a reaffirmation of the fact that the English choral tradition is not dead and, and can be renewed by a genius. William Walton was born in the industrial Lancashire town of Oldham, but seemed keen to escape it. Walton had little to say about Oldham, but then he was a reluctant interviewee. Your home life when you were a boy in Oldham, that wasn't sort of grand or posh, was it? It was not at all anything but. Tough. Tough it was, yeah. William was a very private person, so he felt rather offended that questions were slung at him. And so the key wonderful solution, he used to say yes, no, or maybe. Could you look after yourself on a desert island? Oh, yes. Cook? No. Yes. And the poor wretched interviewer didn't know what to say, what to ask, what to do. So I'm a bit sort of stuck here. <laughs> <laughs> and this was wonderful. Even Ted Heath told me once that when he saw William, he said, that's it, that's the solution. You just say yes, no, or maybe. I can't tell you how I do it at all. I won't press you any further on that. Are you busy writing on his gear? I mean, are we going to hear? Not really. Do you ever turn to facade again? Not if I can help it. William, isn't it time we had a full-length biography of you? Is it possible? Uh, I didn't think just yet, you know. I'm rather young for that.
This is where William Walton was born at 93 Werneth Hall Road in March 1902. It's hardly the most deprived area of town. In fact, it's where the rather better off residents of Oldham tended to live. Both my parents were singers. My father in particular was choir master in the local church of St. John's. And he made me sing in the choir and I loathed it. And he used to rap me over the knuckles when I sang a wrong note, which is very often. That way I learned to be rather accurate. Here we are in the church where Walton's father was organist and choir master for over 20 years. Looking around us now, it's a junk shop and a carpet shop. Young Walton learnt to sing here. I mean, he'd have sung the creation Messiah many times. It's said that he could sing the Messiah from memory before he could even speak. And I think this is where the seeds of Belshazzar's feast were sown. This small piece was written by Walton when he was 14 and lay in a library in America and I found it there recently and as far as I know, this is its first performance. For a small boy of 14, the harmony, it's very sophisticated. He hadn't had much harmony tuition, and I suspect that he acquired this knowledge as much from singing a lot of church music and singing in his father's choir before he went to Christ Church, Oxford. I mean, it's not the sort of music you expect uh, from a young boy at school. mother saw an advertisement for a choral scholarship at Christ Church, Oxford, and so they arranged to go to Oxford by train to have an oral examination. And family legend, probably perfectly true, is that the money which had been saved up for the train journey and sort of put in a mug on the dresser probably, was taken by father down to the pub the night before and spent on booze. And so when the mother came to look for it next morning, it all gone. she had to borrow the train fare from the greengrocer. They caught a later train. They actually missed the time for the examination, but the examiner very kindly heard William and gave him the place at Oxford. From Christ Church Choir School, Walton went on to become an undergraduate at Oxford. But despite musical promise and sporting ability in the rowing team, he didn't do well academically. Perhaps his most valuable achievement was to befriend Sir Cheverell Sitwell, youngest of the fashionable Sitwell family. So when Walton was sent down, the Sitwells asked him to London, and he didn't have to go back to Oldham as he feared. The reason why William would not uh, come back to live in Oldham was that he, there was no chance then of making a living as a composer. There was very little chance anywhere else, and that is why he was so lucky to meet the Sitwells, who put a little roof over him and kept him under that comfortable umbrella for 15 years. Otherwise, William would have never been heard of, ever. In all the right London circles, the Sitwell family were making a name for themselves. Osbert, Edith and Sir Cheverell's belief in Walton as a composer led to Facade, the piece that really put him on the map. He set Edith's eccentric poems, which she recited from behind a curtain through a megaphone. It was very interesting to see him working on these poems because he wrote with great rapidity. And I don't think even that he's particularly fond of poetry, but he obviously has an extraordinary instinct for words. And it was a very, very remarkable achievement for a young boy of under 20. Days 
lazy and lily, lazy and silly, walk by the shore of the warm grassy sea, talking once more neath the swans and tree. Those castles to rails, those bustles where swells each home bell of ermine, they roam and determine what passions have been and what passions will be, what tartan leaves born, what crinolines worn. Facade is very much influenced by jazz and popular music and he took the brilliance of the jazz world and married it in an extraordinary way to the brilliance of the texts. Edith Sitwell was a remarkable explorer of words but I think without Walton's music we wouldn't remember these poems so much now. See me dance the polka, said Mr. Wag like a bear, with my top hat and my whiskers that tra la la trap the fair. With a waiting chime in haycocks, I dance the polka there. Stand Venus, children in gay frocks, maroon and marine and stare. To see me fire my pistol. To the distance blew as my coat. Like Wellington Bar and the Marquis of Bristol, Busby great trees float. While the wheezing hurdy-gurdy of the marine wind blows me to the tune of Annie Rooney sturdy over the sheafs of the sea. And bright as the seedsman's packet with zinnia's candy tufts chill. Is Mrs. Marigold's jacket? As she gapes at the indoor still. Where dawn in the box of the sailor, blue as the decks of the sea, Nelson awoke, crowed like the cock, then back to the dust sack. And Rob is a Crusoe Russo, the bright and foxy beer. But he finds fresh isles and a negress smiles, a boxy doxy dear. As he watched me dance the polka. Did Mr. Wag like a bear. In my top hat and my whiskers that. Tra la 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 trap the fair. Tra la 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 tra la 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 tra la 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 Walton did spend some time when he was short of cash, which was most of the time in this period, writing Foxtrot's the Savoy House Orchestra. And there are legacies from Facade and the whole years when he was very fascinated by jazz in Belshazzar's Feast. For one thing, there's a saxophone in the orchestra, which uh, certainly I can't think of any holy piece up to that period which had a saxophone in. You certainly don't think of Elgar putting a saxophone into his scores. This is followed by a passage for the chorus, which again shows the kind of syncopated feel. Um, in Babylon, Belshazzar the king made a great feast, made a feast to uh, and so on, which is quite sort of swung. The commission for Belshazzar's Feast was one of the first given by the BBC to a British composer. The BBC suggested that I should write a piece on a subject that everybody knew about. Actually, it sounds simple to find a subject that everybody knows about. It isn't really. And I talked to Ross about it, and he suggested Belshazzar's Feast and the writing on the wall, which is a fairly universal subject, I should have thought. The first London performance was broadcast in November of 1931, but it had been premiered in Leeds Town Hall in October, conducted by Malcolm Sargent. I was there, terrified, I must say. It sounded like nothing on earth, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> what did the audience think? Well, they were sort of mesmerised into accepting it, I thought. The town hall was opened in 1858. It was designed by Cuthbert Broderick and it is the place where the Leeds Festival Chorus does most of its concerts. Ever since 1858, when the first Leeds Festival happened, the chorus has been singing here. And in 1931, the hall would have looked pretty much as it looks now. The hall was revamped to original specifications not too long ago. And especially the crushed strawberry pillars came as quite a shock to the people who had to sing. 
It is in a long line of very notable northern town halls and especially notable for the wonderful Victorian moralistic slogans such as trial by jury, honesty is the best policy, etc. It's, uh, it's, it's a great uplifting experience to sing in here and to see these things around the top of the roof. It's so frustrating, isn't it, playing the piano? Yes, you you know, so inadequate. It's so inadequate. For this masterworks performance, the BBC Symphony Chorus and Leeds Festival Chorus are joining forces. In the Cloth Workers' Hall, this is their first rehearsal together with Andrew Davis and BBC Chorus Master Stephen Jackson. Um, it falls to me to say what an enormous pleasure it is for the BBC Symphony Chorus to be meeting and collaborating with the Leeds Festival Chorus. Um, it's a little bit complicated in that we have firsts and seconds in the BBC in both Choir 1 and Choir 2, so that you might just find yourself um, if you are a member of the Leeds Festival Chorus, standing next to somebody singing a part that you would not expect. This is either because <laughs> the person concerned has not been to enough rehearsals, or it's for rather better reasons than that. Belshazzar's Feast is notorious for the problems it gave the choir at the first performance, and despite familiarity, it still has its challenges, even for experienced choruses. Belshazzar is really the icing on the cake as far as the commissions that for the Leeds Festival Chorus. We've had music from Elgar, Parry, Sullivan, Vorjak, and more recently music from Michael Barclay and others. But I think Belshazzar is the piece that has just taken off ever since we did it in 1931. Everybody sings it now, it's a great experience, and we're very proud to have it as part of our history. This is my father's score of Belshazzar's Feast, which he sang from in 1931 which is very well used. He's sung from it a lot of times since then. You can see it's been repaired a lot of times. And it was autographed by William Walton. It's always been in the family and it'll always stay there. I don't want any Sunday morning sound here. Um, the altos are still flat on page 17. The sopranos are still flat at the top of 18. So, you know, we need the works, okay? Good. Quaver upbeat to the bar before nine. My father was a member of the Leeds Triennial Festival Chorus in 1931 when the first performance of Belshazzar was given. And he told my mother that it was a very strange piece, quite unusual. He'd never sung anything like it before and wasn't quite sure what he felt about it. And then as rehearsals progressed, he got quite excited about it. He said to my mum, Whichever concert you come to in the festival, you must come to this one. It's going to be really something. This whole, th this whole thing wants to swing a bit more, you know. It's all a bit too straight sort of English choral tradition here. I've been in Leeds Festival Chorus a long time, and my father was in Leeds Festival Chorus a long time, and we were in the chorus together. And when I first sang Belshazzar, 
I remember saying how difficult I found it. And he said to me, you're finding it difficult. How do you think we coped with it when we first sang it in 1931? Give me more of the accents and, and really... Hey, 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 hey. A bit more Count Basie, if you know what I mean. Belshazzar's feast was seen when it first appeared as very radical. But underneath the sort of superficial modernity of it, there's a lot that does link it to the past. It had its new qualities, but basically it's a glorious panoply, great use of chorus and orchestra in, in, in a huge sort of romp. <laughs> Leeds Festival Chorus mythology has it that the brass bands were placed on either side of the organ. We have tried it in different positions, but I think it is much better up there. Although William was born in Oldham and brass bands were the thing, he had never used them. So this was the first opportunity he had to sort of blow his own trumpet, let's say. It is a marvelous effect that you get the sound reverberating from one side of the hall to the other. Only once or twice in the life of each one of us comes such a day as this, when we realize that we're watching history in the making, when we know that generations of Englishmen to come will look back on this day. The authorities in England were very impressed with Belshazzar's feast, and they asked William to write the first coronation march They realized that they had a, a young man here who could produce the grand sound that you would have for a coronation. And William was so thrilled because Crown Imperial was so enormously successful. Walton's English pomp and circumstance style was just part of an amazing creative output in the 20s and 30s, including the first symphony, his first major work after Belshazzar. The fast scherzo of the symphony is quite original and is a legacy from Belshazzar. This brilliant, hard-edged writing and the sort of brutality of some of the ideas is very much taken from the barbarity of, of, of the choral piece, but put into more abstract symphonic terms. Good. Uh, can you, in the strings, really grip this first note? It's like, each time it happens. I'm very, very biting and nasty everywhere, please. Thank you. <laughs> Scherzo is marked con malizia, with malice, and he needn't have written it really because it's, <laughs> it's so obvious. There's a kind of dangerous quality that you see in so much of the whole culture of Europe between the two world wars. <laughs> Thank you. 
This dynamic rhythm and energy is one side of Waltram's music. But there's also a great lyrical beauty in which the Sitwells also had a hand. The day that the Sitwells took William off to Italy was really one of the best turns they ever did him because Italy became so important to him and influenced his music and of course eventually he lived there for the major part of his life. beginning of the Violin Concerto, which was commissioned by Jascha Heifetz, who was that time the greatest violinist in the world, was probably the most beautiful tune he ever wrote. Oh, it really does convey this wonderful sense of Mediterranean sunlight and sunshine and lazy afternoons and also of love. Italy was a most enormous influence in William's life. As he came from Oldham, and the weather there is rather on the grey side, the moment William was brought by the Sitwells to Amalfi, he discovered a new world, the light. See, this is the main thing for a composer. You write on white paper with black lines and a pencil or a pen and you always in England must have electric light. While here, the light was white, brilliant, and he could work without aid of the electric light, and this made the most enormous difference to him. Walton first came to Ischia with his wife Susanna just after the war, and then in 1961 they built this house and garden as an environment in which Walton could work. The garden was originally designed by Russell Page, and it's now known as one of the most beautiful, one of the most magnificent in the whole of the Mediterranean. The languor and warmth of the violin concerto might seem to belong to a very different world to Belshazzar, but all's not necessarily what it seems. It's not the sort of music that you can, you can lean back, in my opinion, and let it just bask all over you. On its world premiere, they spoke about it being a personal, intense, direct, and straightforward piece, which for me says, frankly, rather more about Oldham than Ischia. There's something all the time urging the music forward and there is that same quality there in Belshazzar in so much of his music. There's a quirkiness about his music. There's a twinkle in the eye. It could actually have only been written by one person, and that's him. does Oldham regard Walton and how has it over the years regarded him? Well, he was a bit of a forgotten figure. 
he moved away, moved to Italy, and he only came back occasionally to visit his mum. And it was really only after his death that the people began to remember him again. And so is there a kind of permanent memorial, I mean, you know, a statue or something? Well, we're doing two things. There's a living memorial in the annual Walton Festival that takes place every year now. And then here in Spindle Shopping Centre, yes, there is a permanent memorial as well. You've seen the clock at the far end of the mall, which chimes a bit of Crown Imperial on the hour, every hour. Just, just a little reminder. And I'm quite sure that all the shoppers say themselves, that's Crown Imperial by William Walton. Well, if one more does every day, well, then we're getting somewhere, aren't we? And then up here, there's some very beautiful coloured glass. Now, that's all been inspired by Walton, This it? was a tribute by fellow Alderman, Brian Clark, and it tells his life and work through a series of tableaux. The one we're beneath now looks at his letter home, for instance, to his mum from Oxford asking for a bit more money when he was 16 and takes us right through to include a page of the full score of Belshazzar's Feast. <laughs> you get a flavour of the Italian at warmth and colour, don't you? Well, he would like the palm trees too. I think you do get a feeling of what it might have been like to sit under the trellis at La Mortella uh, and soak up the sunshine, even in Oldham. I don't think William's music ever came easily. And he used to say, that it was worse than having a baby because it lasted longer than nine months and was much more painful. But Belshaz, I think, was one of the wonderful occasions in William's life when everything came together. I don't hear enough gong. It needs as much low pitch as you can give it. The overall structure of the piece is extremely satisfying. You're swept along by it, tension builds up and as, until you feel as though you can't stand it any longer and then just at the right moment something happens to release it and then the most marvellous one being of course the writing on the wall. It's one example of Walton's very imaginative use of the orchestra. And this was the writing that was written the castanets making a creaking noise, low moanings in the percussion and the double basses. Bene, bene, it's one of the eeriest passages in music. <laughs> sounds a bit cheerful. <laughs> Coming out of this really sort of creepy music, it now needs to sound very, very shocked and horrified and, and just ghastly, really. So let's do a ghastly Slane once, just to... Uh, uh, really. Slane! 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 There you go, just Slane. When the dust settles, we'll see Walton as a very important figure who did break new ground, and we do wonder at the sort of sheer barbaric splendor of it all. I think it nevertheless continued a glorious tradition and, and yet showed, a, as it were, a new direction that this tradition could move in. Belshazzar is one of these landmark pieces, and I don't think he was trying to send us a message. He wanted a, a splendid, dramatic work for a choral festival and that's what he gave us and um, without any frills and that's why it's such a damn good piece.
great city, her merchandise was of gold and silver, of precious stones, of pearls, of fine linen, of purple, silk, and scarlet, all manner vessels of ivory, all manner vessels of most precious wood, 
of brass, iron, and marble, cinnamon odors and ointments, of frankincense, wine, and oil, fine flour, wheat, and beasts, sheep, horses, chariots, slaves, and the souls of men.
same hour as they feasted, came forth fingers of a man's hand. And the king saw the part of the hand that was the writing that was written. Night was the shadows of the king slain, and his kingdom divided. 